Well, uh, good evening, folks. Um, let me uh, thank Andrew uh, for his uh, words of welcome and the uh, Committee of the Historical Society for uh, inviting me uh, to uh, give this talk. And thank you to you uh, for coming along on such a, a wintry evening, uh, even though it's uh, still uh, in October. Uh, so it's good to uh, have you uh, have you along here. <clears throat> Having uh, written a book on Jonathan Edwards and the Lord's Supper, uh, one of the most common questions uh, that I've been asked is, who is it for? And I hope that it has really a twofold audience. I hope that it contributes to Edwards' studies uh, by dealing with a neglected area of his theology. And as such, its audience is uh, those who are interested uh, in Edwards' scholarship. I hope also that it's a book uh, that is accessible uh, to the general Christian reader. And as such, uh, I wanted to provide a lens uh, through which readers who may or may not be interested uh, in Edwards uh, can examine their own theology uh, and practice regarding the supper. With this in mind, uh, my aim uh, is that this evening's lecture would fulfill a similar function. It will, as the title suggests, consider Edwards' view of the Lord's Supper. Uh, so you will be getting what it says in the tin, uh, as it were. Uh, I'll focus on the historical context in which he uh, ministered uh, and look at some of the features of his sacramental uh, theology. But then, since this lecture is being delivered in an Irish Baptist context, I also want to take some time towards the end uh, to consider how Edwards might help us uh, to think about our own uh, practice. John Edwards, born 1703, died in 1758, uh, was one of the most celebrated figures in the evangelical movement uh, that swept the English-speaking world in the 18th century. During the more than 20 years of ministry that he fulfilled in Northampton, Massachusetts, in what were then the uh, English colonies in North America, he led his uh, congregation through two seasons of revival. And this helped to bring him to international uh, attention, at least again in the English-speaking world. His ministry in Northampton, however, came to an ignominious end when his congregation dismissed him. Although various stresses and strains were at work in the background, the presenting issue was that he changed his view on who should be admitted to the Lord's Supper. By 1749, it had become public that he now adopted a position on the subject that overturned decades on the qualifications for admission to the supper. Northampton's position was to some extent novel and had been introduced by his predecessor, Solomon Stoddard. Stoddard was a revered figure who had ministered at the church for 60 years and was dubbed by some as the Pope of the Connecticut Valley. Although Edwards uh, complied with Stoddard's practice regarding the Lord's Supper until almost the end of his time uh, in Northampton, an examination of his writings and sermons indicates that for much of the time he actually lived with unresolved tensions between what he saw as the significance of the supper and how it was practiced in the town. In order to understand this better, I think it's necessary for us to trace some of the historical background to the celebration of the sacrament in its New England context. So let's think together for a moment or two about the background. In the medieval church, uh, the celebration of the Mass the unbloodied representation of Christ's sacrifice at the altar was the high point of church practice and crucial to the matter of salvation. With the Reformation came a new understanding of salvation that was centred upon the finished work of Christ at Calvary and this did away with the need for the Mass. It proved easier, however, to dispense with the Mass than to agree now about how the Lord's Supper should be celebrated. And this issue of how the Lord's Supper should be celebrated was one of the most protracted and contentious issues amongst early figures in the Reformation, notably between Lutherans and the Reformed. Yet not even the Reformed were agreed 
about the meaning of the supper and what it represented. Furthermore, key figures such as Calvin often changed their minds. This lack of a fixed understanding among the Reformed is then reflected in the variety of views that are expressed in the various confessions that were produced by uh, Reformation scholars. In England, uh, where the Reformation lagged behind the continent, the celebration of the sacrament was ultimately informed by European debates and then by the ideas of Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. By the accession of Elizabeth, in 1558, much of the heat had dissipated surrounding debates about the supper. And there seems to have been a widely held, although not clearly articulated, consensus about its meaning. Subsequently, there were few significant disagreements amongst English churchmen about the subject. Rather, the focus now moved to the issue of the further reform of the Church of England. Where there were continuing debates about the supper, they were less concerned about the meaning of the sacrament and what was occurring in the sacrament than the attendant practices, which many believed made it still resemble the mass too much. Those who pushed for further reform were known as precisionists, or we more commonly call them today Puritans. Amid the fervent ecclesiastical debates of Elizabethan England, it became clear to some that further reform of the church was unlikely, or if it did come, it certainly would not go far enough. As a result, they began to advocate for separation from the established church. Although pursuing separatism was precarious, and in some cases fatal, by the early decades of the 17th century, it was a fact of English ecclesiastical life. Those who took this path now find themselves embroiled in debates about maintaining the purity of the church. Many among them came to believe that only a pure church, which consisted of those who had undergone a true work of conversion, could properly administer the sacraments. While many who held to these views remained as independents, others continued to work out the implications of their views and came to adopt a Baptist ecclesiology. Concern over persecution and desire for freedom amongst these groups led some to pursue their view of the church by removing themselves to the Netherlands. From here, some of them then proceeded to the colonies of North America. <coughs> Those who settled in the region that became known as New England adopted a congregational polity. And they emphasized the visible purity of the church, a church which consisted of true believers, or in the phraseology that they used, visible saints. The church should consist of visible saints existing in communion with one another. Now, while these churches continued to practice infant baptism based on the belief that children of believing parents were included in the covenant, they denied the Lord's Supper to those who had been baptized until they were able to satisfy the church that they had truly undergone a regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. This gave rise to what has become known as the conversion narrative. In other words, a person gave an account of their conversion that conformed to a certain, although a much debated set of steps that had resulted in their conversion. This usually involved steps such as humiliation, legal awakening, conviction, spiritual conflict, genuine sorrow, and ultimately a sense of assurance. It was only upon the relation of such an experience that a person could then become a full church member and be admitted to the supper. Furthermore, it was only those who were admitted to full church membership who could offer their children then for baptism and enjoy the full rights of citizenship, including the right to vote and to own land. This approach to church membership was beset by several problems. First, not everyone could account for salvation in the prescribed manner. And this led to people either molding their experience uh, to fit the 
uh, the expected formula, or was it increasingly the case, refraining from applying for church membership. For secondly, to apply for church membership and to then partake of the supper without a genuine work of conversion meant a person eating and drinking unworthily. This was something that they were repeatedly told had eternal consequences. And as a result, many people were reluctant to place themselves in spiritual danger by coming to the Lord's Supper in an unconverted or unworthy manner. Thirdly, as the spiritual fervor of the first generation of settlers passed, fewer people became full church members. And as such, they could not then offer their children for baptism. This began to lead to a lack of cohesion, not only in the church, but in the wider society. By the late 17th century, there was a growing sense of crisis in New England. And a new approach to baptism and church membership was now adopted. It was now agreed that baptized parents who did not profess conversion could present their children for baptism. Nonetheless, it remained the case that no one could participate at the Lord's Supper without first being able to relate their conversion experience. Critics dubbed the new position the halfway covenant. One keen supporter of the new approach was Solomon Stoddart, uh, the pastor of the Northampton Church. Yet even this did not go far enough for him. By the end of the century, he began advocating the idea that the Lord's Supper should not be placed on a different level than other ordinances, such as preaching and prayer. Instead, people should be encouraged to attend the Lord's Supper, which he argued was a converting ordinance. Stoddard was prepared to admit to the Lord's table any who were baptized, held to the main principles of the Christian religion, and were not living scandalous lives. Now his view did not meet with widespread support in New England, and it was, it seems, only ever adopted in his own town in the early 18th century. By the time Edwards became his grandfather's assistant in 1726, this approach to the sacrament had been in place for more than a decade. Stoddard died in 1729, and Edwards <coughs> succeeded him to become the sole pastor in Northampton. Although he revered his grandfather, who had led the church through five seasons of revival, or five harvests as he called them, Edwards was uneasy about some of his grandfather's practices. One area of concern was his practice concerning admission to the Lord's Supper. While he continued with his grandfather's practice, there was almost 20 years before his misgivings became public, is evident from an examination of his works that he was never fully comfortable with Stoddard's view of how the sacrament should be celebrated. So uh, much of that uh, really is by way of background, uh, and I do want to think now uh, a little more about Edward's view uh, of the Lord's Supper. Looking at his writings on the subject, we see that he had a rich, multifaceted theology of the Lord's Supper. This is evident in his personal writings and in his sermons, where he preached a sacramental sermon every eight weeks in preparation for its celebration. And four key ideas, I think, about the significance of the, sub, the supper can then be identified uh, in his work. First of all, Edwards viewed the supper as a memorial. He described it as a holy supper to be celebrated in remembrance of the Lord Christ and his redemption. The Lord Jesus, he believed, had inaugurated the supper as a perpetual reminder of his death at Calvary. And he had commanded all Christians to celebrate it. It was necessary, he believed, to have such a reminder. Since he said even great events in the past have been forgotten. So we need such memorials. Yet though he spoke of it as a memorial, he believed that it was more than a bare reminder of Christ's death. 
Rather, its aim was, he wrote, to fix our minds and to give us lively ideas of Christ and the things of Christ. So this memorial should not only inform our minds, it should also stir our hearts. The memorial also served as a means by which Christians might proclaim Christ. As they celebrated the supper, they testified, he said, their respect to Christ in this ordinance by giving up ourselves entirely unto Jesus Christ, making a solemn renewed dedication of ourselves to him. In doing this, Christians renewed their commitment to the Lord Jesus and declared the infinite excellence of his person. Significantly for Edwards, although this was a memorial meal, he did not consider Christ to be absent from it. He told his congregation, if we come to the Lord's Supper and find nothing of Christ there and don't meet with him, we shall have reason to go away mourning and with heavy hearts. Christ was present with his people as they celebrated the supper. And that, he believed, ought to fill them with the greatest joy and stir their hearts. And this is a recurrent theme in each of the ways that Edwards thought about the supper. And give me the subtitle of the book, that at the table Christ met with his people. Christ met with his people. To some extent, Edwards saw Christ's presence as being represented in the actions of the minister as he presided at the sacrament. Edwards followed in a dissenting tradition that saw the supper as a dramatic reenactment of the first celebration, with the minister taking the role of Christ and offering the bread and the wine to the congregation. Just as at that first supper, Jesus had offered the bread and the wine to his disciples. If in preaching the minister spoke with the voice of Christ as he believed, in ministering the sacrament then, he acted on Christ's behalf. In this way, there was a sense in which Christ was especially present at the sacrament, especially present in the person of the minister as he distributed the bread and the wine. He also saw this as a distinctive memorial because of its physical nature. Because of the physical nature of eating bread and drinking wine, he believed that engaged all the human senses. Therefore, this was a multi-sensory way of meeting with Christ. So he viewed the supper as a memorial. Secondly, he viewed the supper as a covenant seal. The idea of the supper as a covenant seal was especially prominent in New England, where the sacraments were simply, simply referred sometimes, to sometimes as the seals. The seals. And Edwards argued that in the celebration of the sacrament, Christ sealed his covenant with his people, and his people sealed their participation in the covenant. He stated that in the sacrament, a mutual covenanting between God and us is most solemnly renewed and sealed. This mutual covenanting that there is between God and his people is never more solemnly transacted than it is in this ordinance. So for Edwards, participation in the sacrament was in effect a covenant renewal ceremony. This sealing represented the union between Christ and his people and their mutual friendship. Thinking about the supper in this way, Edwards again thought that the minister of the sacrament acted in Christ's place, confirming his covenant with his people. Uh, and again, we see that in this way, again, Christ is present at the table with his people. So a covenant seal. The third way that Edwards thought uh, of the supper was as a means of spiritual nourishment. This idea was prominent in the Reformed tradition. However, writers tend to be better at stating uh, they believed this than explaining how it actually happened. For Edwards at the supper, participants feasted upon, he says, Christ with his benefits that he purchased by his obedience and death and which he communicates to his spirit, or sorry, by his spirit. He noted that such benefits included sanctification, spiritual knowledge, 
the manifestation of God's favour, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, and the exercises of holiness in good works. Again, he believed that a meal was an appropriate way to do this, because, he wrote, it nourishes the soul as food does the body. It gives life and strength to it. And he pushed this idea further, stating that it was actually more than a meal. It was a feast. Well, why was it a feast? It was a feast because in a feast, the provision is what excels ordinary food. The provision that God has made for our souls in Christ, he writes, is exceeding excellent. This meal, he said, reminds us that God has provided abundantly for every need of our souls. For Edwards, the soul was nourished in the supper, he writes, by viewing of the beauty of Jesus Christ as the body lives by food. So when the believer sees the divine beauty of Christ, it refreshes his inward man, it rejoices his heart, it quiets his soul. When a person feeds upon Christ in this way, he continues, it begets and draws forth gracious inclinations and desires and holy affection and enables him to perform truly gracious and holy actions and to bring forth fruit unto holiness, to walk and run in the ways of God's commandments and to be of a heavenly conversation. As such, when someone participated in the supper, they should enjoy the happiness of divine love, as there they contemplate the magnitude of what God has accomplished through the death of his Son. In the supper, Christians discovered, he wrote, a real sense and apprehension of the divine excellency of things revealed in the Word of God, a spiritual and saving conviction of the truth and reality of these things, which arises from such a sight of their divine excellency and glory. So that this conviction of their truth is in effect a natural consequence of this sight of their divine glory. So here in this supper there was spiritual nourishment. Fourthly then, Edwards viewed the supper as a means of communion. This communion was both vertical and horizontal. He stated in one sermon, the thing designed in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is the communion of Christians in the body and blood of Christ. As he talked about communion, he again laid particular emphasis on the fact that as Christians, they sat at the Lord's table and Christ sat with them. He stated Christians may look upon Christ as sitting with them at his table. His presence with his people on this occasion was as real as his physical presence with the disciples at the inaugural supper. As such, when people participate in the meal by faith, he writes, they come to have actual communion in the body and blood of Christ. Once more, he stressed the important role of the one who ministered at the sacrament, because everything about its celebration was set to remind us of that first celebration. As in the first supper, the minister stood in Christ's place. The bread and wine represented the body and blood, the suffering of Christ, and his offering of himself to God and to believers as they fed upon the elements. He also remarked that the bread and wine were especially appropriate since they were the basics of life. Also, their simplicity meant that a person's attention was not drawn to these things. But through these things, they began to look at spiritual realities, the spiritual realities that they represented. The bread and wine were simply signs, just as the preached word was a sign, pointing beyond itself to divine realities. He also saw the supper as a means by which a person might satisfy their spiritual appetites. When God regenerated a person, he placed within them a new set of spiritual desires. While our physical appetites ought to be restrained, he said no such limits should be set, should be set upon spiritual appetites, which he said should be given unbounded 
liberty. The person who is born again should hunger, he says, after those pleasures that are spiritual. The pleasure of seeing the glory of Christ and enjoying his love and having communion with him. The supper was the ideal means for a person to both stimulate their appetite for Christ and also to satisfy it by feasting upon him. As he stated, here we may hope in some measure to have our longing soul satisfied in this world by the gracious communications of the Spirit of God. And such occasions for Edwards pointed towards the great eschatological feast when Christ would eat and drink with his people in his eternal kingdom. And his people, he writes, would fully enjoy Christ and shall with Christ enjoy God the Father and shall partake with him in his enjoyment of the Father's love and the complacence that he hath in his Son. But at the supper, Christians enjoyed not only communion with the Lord Jesus, they also enjoyed communion with their fellow believers. Edwards pointed out that communion involved mutual participation in the benefits won by Christ. As such participation, he says, is not a partaking of the same benefits separately and ignorantly and unwillingly, but as a common partaking of benefits in union and society. If a person was to have true communion with Christ in the Lord's Supper, then he must also have communion with Christ's people who share in the same blessings, since those that are in Christ they have the Spirit of Christ. The celebration of the Supper demonstrated, he says, how all the Church of Christ doth partake with Christ in his spiritual benefits, how they partake with him in the benefit of his suffering and righteousness, and partaking with him of his Spirit and of his joy and comfort. In the Supper, Christians enjoyed Christ's benefit together. And they enjoyed their common union with him. The supper was a place where Christians set aside their differences. And enjoyed true fellowship with one another. And in this way again the celebration of the sacrament was an anticipation <coughs> of the great eschatological feast. Now I argue uh, really in the book then that putting together these various elements... Uh, in Edward's theology of the supper, it becomes clear that he could never have been entirely comfortable with Stoddard's view that this was a converting ordinance. If the supper was a memorial feast in which Christ's people remembered his death in an affecting way and contemplated his presence, then it's difficult to conceive that there was any benefit for the unconverted. Likewise, those who did not participate in the covenant could not seal the covenant again. It was asking them to seal a covenant whose fundamental terms they rejected. Nor could there be any nourishment by the Spirit at the table for those who had never received the Spirit of Christ. And on the same basis, an unconverted person could not enjoy communion with Christ and his people if he had not first entered into a saving union with Christ. While Edwards may have accepted his grandfather's practice regarding admission to the supper, his understanding of what occurred in the supper really precluded any benefit for the unconverted, unless that was uh, accidental. This becomes even clearer uh, when Ed we look at Edwards' views on 1 Corinthians 11 that passage that Andrew uh, read to us. For in all the Puritan tradition, a key text regarding the Lord's Supper was 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Everyone in this tradition, including Edwards, recognized the importance of self-examination before participating in the Supper. This self-examination, he said, was with a view to critically try our behaviour by the institutions and rules of Christ, taking care strictly to conform ourselves thereto. He continued, if we would examine and judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
or if we were judged, it would not be to condemnation, but only as being chastened as children that we might escape condemnation. Self-examination, in other words, was not to be practiced so that a person would exclude themselves from the table, but that they might participate in the table in the correct way and that they might enjoy all its benefits. As he pointed out in one sermon, let us therefore take heed to ourselves at all times before we come to the Lord's Supper to search and try ourselves and see if there be any wicked way in us. Let us think in our ways and turn our feet into God's testimonies, humbling ourselves for our past sins and taking serious resolutions of future amendment. Self-examination was an occasion for repentance before the supper. It was an occasion to set right relationships with fellow Christians when they had soured. As Edwards exhorted his congregation to self-examination, at least part of his purpose was to warn those who were tempted to come to the supper and eat and drink in an unworthy manner. His warning was directed at those who only participated in the supper so that they might then be qualified to offer their children for baptism. He also warned those who lived ungodly lives and then came to the sacrament as a matter of social convention before once again turning and returning to their godless lifestyle. For Edwards, participating in the supper unworthily was a piece of mockery in which people were in danger of eating and drinking condemnation on their own souls. He concluded in one sermon, if you live in any known way of wickedness, don't come here to eat and drink damnation to yourselves. With such stern warnings in place, it's difficult to believe that Edwards was ever comfortable with the idea that unconverted people had a place at the supper. The implications of his personal views, as I've said, lag behind church practice. Those implications became public in 1749 when a young man approached Edwards with a view to becoming a communicant member of the church. He was in fact the first to do so for several years. Edwards examined him in the usual way, but he also asked if he could give a credible and visible profession of true godliness. This was not the conversion narrative of earlier times, but simply an expression, he says, that they themselves should suppose the essential things belonging to Christian piety to be in them. Well, news of this proposed change on how a person should be granted admission to full membership spread rapidly in the small town. And it led really to a year of debate in Northampton, at the end of which Edwards was removed from the church with only around 10% of the congregation supporting him. He left Northampton in 1751, became a pastor and missionary to the Indians in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He remained there until his appointment as president of the College of New Jersey, later Princeton Seminary, in 1758. Shortly after taking up the role, he died as a result of smallpox inoculation. So what about uh, Irish Baptists? I think before I address that, I need a drink of water. Um, <laughs> not just for baptismal reasons, but... Uh. <clears throat> so how ought we as Irish Baptists, uh, I think, reflect on Edwards and his views of the Lord's Supper? I think undoubtedly we will have some sympathy for his views, which ultimately saw him dismissed that only those who can give an account of having undergone genuine conversion should be admitted to the Lord's Supper. That, of course, reflects our practice as Irish Baptists, as we believe in the idea of a gathered church. Do we, however, have more to learn from Edwards on this subject? Well, let me uh, have the temerity uh, to suggest four ways in which his views might cause us further reflection. First of all, as we've seen, Edwards held the Lord's Supper in high esteem, as did his grandfather. Yet part of his grandfather's argument was that there was a danger 
in elevating the supper above the other ordinances that Christians were required to attend, such as prayer and preaching. Stoddard's view is one that Irish Baptists, again, have some sympathy with, and that we've tried to avoid the suggestion that there's grace available in the supper that is not available in other means. As such, the supper is not a special means of grace. Yet, Stoddard took this view in a direction that as Baptists we are uncomfortable with, that the unconverted, therefore, should be able to attend the supper in the same way as we would encourage them to attend the preaching of the word. Edwards, on the other hand, viewed the supper as being an event of great significance, notably because Christ, as we've seen, met with his people at the sacrament in a particular manner. He met with them in the same way <clears throat> as he met with his disciples at that inaugural meal. As a result, there was genuine communion between Christ and his people. In one sense, Christ was available to his people in the supper in a way that he is not available to them through other means. Therefore, only those who have faith in Christ should sit at his table. We may not disagree with the nuts and bolts of how he gets there, but we do agree uh, with his conclusion. And yet I think we might also feel the tension between these two views. The supper is not a special means of grace, but it cannot be treated in exactly the same way as other means, such as preaching and prayer. After all, there is no other means given to us where we are called upon to examine ourselves before participation. So while we might exercise caution about elevating the Lord's Supper to a special position, we nonetheless need to understand that there is something distinctive in its celebration. Secondly, as Irish Baptists, we are committed to a memorialist view of the Supper. And yet I think we must also ask ourselves, what does that view entail? Does it also commit us to the idea, as has been put, of divine absence? Does it mean that as someone has quipped, the last place a Baptist would expect to meet with Christ is at the supper? Certainly the idea of a memorial, as espoused by Edwards and others, did not mean that Christ was absent. Instead, Christ was present with his people as they remembered his death. Through his spirit, he stirred his people to an affectionate remembrance of who he was and what he had accomplished through his death. Furthermore, Christ's presence with his people in this way gave them a foretaste of the greater feast that is to come. As Baptists, we need to ask ourselves if we practice a form of memorialism that does not explore its possibilities to their fullest extent. One of our Irish Baptist forefathers, R. H. Carson of Tobermore, robustly defended a memorialist view of the supper, but also noted not only is it true, as we think, that in the supper we have communion with Christ, but that communion is of the nearest and most intimate character. Has our practice of memorialism, as Michael Hagen has suggested in his recent book, Amidst Us Our Beloved Stands, led to a more careless view of the supper than that which was held by our Baptist forefathers. Thirdly, while Edwards, like many of his Reformed predecessors, believed in the weekly celebration of the supper, the practice in Northampton was to hold the supper every eight weeks. As the supper was celebrated, Edwards regularly took the opportunity to preach a sermon about the sacrament in the week leading up to uh, its celebration. As such, his congregation received regular instruction about its significance alongside exhortations to participate in the supper in a worthy and beneficial way. Now, as we celebrate the supper weekly, it's not practical that on every occasion there is a sermon about the supper. It does, however, raise the question about whether our congregations do receive instruction about its meaning and significance. We hear sermons about baptism, but do we hear sermons about the Lord's Supper? <clears throat> 
Or do we simply assume that everyone understands the Lord's Supper and why we should celebrate it and what we are doing when we celebrate it? In pastoral ministry, perhaps the most common question I was asked about the Lord's Supper was, do we have to do this every week? It always indicated to me a certain weariness with the supper on the part of the inquirer. My answer to the question was that the Lord Jesus instituted this meal for our benefit, not as a hurdle to be overcome. And again, I think it raises the question as to whether or not our congregations need more instruction and exhortation regarding the importance of the Lord's Supper and the benefits to be gained through its celebration. Fourthly and finally, throughout his ministry in Northampton, Edwards was clear about the dangers of participating in the supper in an unworthy manner. This unworthiness could either be in terms of those attending the ordinance who were unqualified or those who were qualified but living with some known sin in their life. Most notably, he was concerned about those who sat at the table while they were at enmity with other members of the congregation. Edwards repeatedly warned against the danger of what he called hypocrisy. By this he didn't mean that a person was deceiving others. But the danger was they were deceiving themselves with regard to their true spiritual condition. The danger for the person who participated unworthily was that he was eating and drinking judgment on himself. The seriousness with which Edwards treated this scriptural warning demonstrates his pastoral concern and the profound significance he attached to the supper. In doing so, he sought to strike a balance between the need for self-examination and the command to eat. The aim of self-examination was not, as I've said, self-exclusion. It was proper preparation. He knew that proper self-examination would reveal all manner of sin in our lives, as he was a realist about the problem of indwelling sin in the life of the Christian. Yet he did not believe that sin should exclude a person from the supper. Rather, it should encourage them to repent and to seek in Christ the only remedy for their condition. Edward's approach to the supper raises the question of whether we as Irish Baptists treat the matter of self-examination before the supper with sufficient seriousness. <clears throat> or is there a danger that we encourage only a perfunctory examination and ignore the Apostle Paul's warning about the danger of eating and drinking unworthily? Do we in our approach to the supper convey the message, at least implicitly, that we can approach this gift from the Lord Jesus in a casual manner which has no consequence. So very briefly a few words of uh, conclusion. So I've said Edward's theology of the supper was rich and multifaceted. It was also the product of a saturation in the Bible's teaching about it. We may not dot every I or cross every T with his sacramental theology, but our reflections on the whole subject will only be deeply enriched, I believe, as we engage with him. Furthermore, his theology prompts us to carefully examine our own understanding of the supper and how our faith might be strengthened and enriched through its celebration. Remembering that, as Edwards put it, its purpose ultimately is to fix our minds, to give us lively ideas of Christ and the things of Christ. Thanks for your attention. <clears throat>